Hello and welcome back and welcome to opening up stock markets for all. An incredibly insightful session. We already had a whole discussion here backstage before even kicking off. So you really can look forward to. As a reminder, my name is Olga Miller. I'm your MC for today's stage. And as this probably will be super insightful and very topical and relevant for all of us, please don't shy away by sharing your opinion, either in the live chat, sharing your questions, but also tweeting, voicing your opinion in social media using the hashtag COGEX 2021. This session will be moderated by Amy French, director at Level 39. And Amy, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Olga. Hello, everyone. It's great to be here on the FinTech and Future of Financial Services stage. Um, as Olga said, my name is Amy French, head of Level 39, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to uh, this virtual COGEX event, uh, opening up stock markets to all. Uh, as a brief introduction of myself um, and Level 39, so Level 39 is the tech community located in the heart of Canary Wharf launched back in 2013 by Canary Wharf Group. If you don't know who they are, they are the most sustainable developer in the UK. Um, Level 39 is home to around 200 startup and scale-ups spanning fintech, cybersecurity, smart cities, blockchain, and more. Uh, Level 39 was the birthplace of Revolut, Digital Shadows, and it's home to many of Europe's fastest growing tech companies, including eToro, who is joining us today. Uh, so a very special welcome to our speakers today. Um, who I will ask to introduce themselves in a moment. We have Yoni Atia, the founder and CEO of eToro, and Jamie Rogozinski, founder of Wall Street Sets. Thank you both for joining us today. Yes, thank, thank you very much for having us. us. So the theme of this panel is looking at the investment market and how we can make it more inclusive and accessible to all. You know, 2020 and you know the start of 2021 was a landmark year for retail investors. With people spending more time at home, many have had the free time to try their hand at investing. As the market dipped and rebounded in the first half of 2020 especially, retail investors flocked into the market and tried to exploit this opportune time to invest. Yet this prolific trend has raised questions about how day traders can and should be interacting with the markets outside of traditional investment houses and left people asking how the industry could evolve to be more inclusive. There are also concerns that gaps in education and insights result in many people effectively gambling. So today we'll be looking at how we can provide greater access as well to the tools, advice, and knowledge for success. So now to the best part, I'd love to introduce our speakers today. Uh, I'll hand over to both of them to share a bit about themselves. So perhaps Yoni, if we can start with you. Sure, I am uh, Yoni Asse, I'm co-founder and CEO of eToro. Uh, eToro is the world's largest social investment uh, platform where we have uh, 20 million registered users from more than 100 different countries who can both uh, talk and converse about uh, both uh, capital markets and cryptocurrencies uh, and the trade commission free stock trading alongside cryptocurrencies uh, with a unique feature of being able to actually see the performance uh, the PL, the mark to market uh, every month of all of the most successful investors, and then automatically copy the most successful investors on our platform. Wonderful. Thank you, Yoni. And Jamie. Hi, uh, I'm Jamie Rogozinski. I'm most known for having founded Wall Street Bets, also the author of Wall Street Bets How Boomers Made the World's Biggest Casino. Uh, entrepreneur at heart, have many different projects. I have a passion for anything and everything that has to do with the stock market and the empowerment of the individuals around the world. Brilliant. Really good to have you both here and thank you for joining us. So let's start off by reflecting on the last year. Um, it's clear that 2020 was a major turning point for retail investment with over 1 million new brokerage accounts opened in the first quarter alone, I believe. So Yoni, coming to you first. So I'm sure eToro were delighted to see the increase of retail investors. Um, did this rise start in 2020 or was this the acceleration of an established trend towards increased adoption from retail investors? I definitely think we've seen an inflection point uh, in 2020. Uh, eToro added uh, half a million funded brokerage accounts uh, in 2020 and over 5 million registered users to the platform. Uh, and, and I think what we saw is, is sort of a, a very certain period of time, which was March 2020, where markets tumbled, institutions were pulling money back 
out of the market and retail investors sort of identified uh, an opportunity and a lot of retail investors were flocking into the markets while institutions were going out of the markets. Uh, and I think that feedback loop created something very interesting alongside, you know, a very interesting confluence of circumstances. <clears throat> zero, zero interest rates, uh, stimulus checks and money uh, printed all around the world at unprecedented rates leading to a very, very wide, probably the widest discussion in human history about the value of money, which sort of connects both the crypto world, but also the stock markets world, leading to you know, a whole new generation sort of figuring out what Warren Buffett has been saying for 50 years, you need your money invested in the markets if you don't want to lose the value of your uh, investments. And, and so what kind of resources were available to those new investors that wanted to get involved in investing? I think today the, the level of resources and information available for retail investors doesn't fall from the largest investors, institutional investors and hedge funds in the world. Um, you know, you have access over the Internet, you know, to so much information uh, to what other people think, to trends. Uh, to the level of integrators uh, that I think, again, what we're seeing now, uh, we're actually seeing institutional investors suddenly looking at platforms like eToro, like Wall Street Bet, looking there for information. Uh, so I think sort of we see sort of a flip where suddenly the information outside freely available on the Internet uh, is as valuable and sometimes even more valuable uh, than information that used to be reserved only for people for whales and, and Wall Street. And Jamie, coming to you, so obviously following from what uh, Yoni mentioned about that kind of step change from March 2020, what have you seen over the last year up until, you know, now mid-year 2021? Well, you know, I saw the rise in retail trading kind of culminating. I agree with you know, that in that the, the catalyst was definitely you know, the inflection point was uh, in 2020. But I'd seen over the years uh, just the, the size of starting as a proxy, the size of Wall Street bets and the number of people that would join it uh, was doubling every single year. Right. And then you have Robin Hood that comes in in the U.S. and it starts making commission free trading and it makes the barriers of entry to the stock market really low as far as how much money you needed, how much time you have to wait. They instantly funded the account, made it very easy and very welcoming for people that didn't know anything about stocks or about stock options even and simplified the entire process and made it kind of a fun uh, interface, a fun experience. And so, I, you know, I saw that growing and growing and growing up until last year, it was just obviously an explosion, right? You have uh, what Yoni mentioned regarding the money, the monetary policy, but you also have people that were stuck at home looking for things to do. There was no sports on TV. A lot of people needed to make extra money because maybe they didn't get paid while they were at home. So yeah, it was it was a natural segue for people to, to, to join. And once they, once they start, playing with the stock market, you start learning about it, uh, they they realize how much easier it is than people, uh, especially institutions or, or uh, the media might have portrayed the complexity of uh, finance in general. And they made it look, this is actually really simple. Uh, let's go ahead and do this. Even even if I go back to my job or when I go back to my job and, and, and that's just continued to grow ever since. And so is it almost that you've seen a, a change in attitude towards trading yeah well given the fact that you've had such a growth i wouldn't say that it's a shift in attitude as much as now we have many more attitudes at the same time you have warren buffett who can continue to do what he does alongside everybody else he goes in he's got a methodology to evaluate the you know book value and market value of a company and finds these underpriced things and he invests in them forever and blah 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 he continues to do that and then when people started getting into the stock market i would see a lot of people trying to guess the individual stocks and learn about them then you see them start gambling with stock options uh then you see different different approaches and then you have this whole new genre that, that got created which is kind of what i'm calling the meme stock approach right which is People like certain stocks. They talk about them. They make memes about it, and uh, and that's how they're. And there's a lot of buzz around these things, and that's how they're able to invest quite successfully. I may, may add. So so the, the, as as people started joining, uh, participants started joining the market. Just more and more approaches started presenting themselves. 
I think it's it's really about sort of a generational buying moment and, and sort of the entire generation. When, when you look at people sort of 18 to 35 or even 45, a lot of them ha have been sort of thinking for a while that trading and investing is complex, it's boring, it's intimidating. There were barriers to entry today with fractional shares, commission-free stock trading. People can download a mobile app and uh, uh, sort of fund it almost immediately and open an account and then open a fraction of a share of Tesla on Amazon. Uh, a, a lot of our platforms significantly simplified and lowered the barriers to entry. And I think that that's just open for a very large movement of a new generation where the majority of, of Gen Y, this is the first time that they're actually trading and investing in the markets. So this is a whole new generation suddenly participating in the markets where historically this used to be, uh, this used to happen with people in their forties or fifties when they had enough money to actually fund accounts. Suddenly this is happening with people in their twenties and their thirties. And again, there's the process of all, also of education. People are starting with, you know, with investing in Tesla because they heard about Tesla or saw Tesla or bought a Tesla uh, or an Apple phone uh, or Netflix or Google. But then what we see at eToro is people are coming with a lot of passion, you know, to a specific stock, but gradually they're actually going through this process of really learning about capital markets, learning about new assets like cryptocurrencies. Uh, so I, I think in general, this is just bringing a lot of people into capital markets, not only in the US, but globally. Uh, I think this year we'll probably see the highest level of new accounts opened for people buying shares online. And just sticking with you, Yoni, quickly, how have traditional investment firms reacted to the increase in, in kind of retail investors? I think historically there are sort of two camps uh, uh, and there's, uh, there, there is and always will be this discussion. I think we, we've been at eToro since 2007, democratizing the world of investing. I've, I've started trading uh, in capital markets since I was 13, very passionate about capital markets. Uh, uh, and, and we believe that this should be a, a part and a pillar of a person's education and ex experiences to understand how to invest in his money in capital markets. Uh, I think some financial institutions you know, feel that they should do this work for others uh, and that people can't cope with understanding capital markets, learning capital markets, understanding risk management, diversification. I, I, I think that's the beauty of, uh, of online platforms of the internet. People can actually learn new traits. And again, learning how to manage your money is basically learning how to manage what you do all day is you go to a job, you make money. You want to also understand what you're doing with that money rather than delegating it to someone who will delegate it to someone mm -hmm. else you won't understand where that is. So, you know, it's clear that people had the access to the tools to invest, uh, you know, 2020, 2021. But I'd like to explore whether those new investors had the resource and knowledge to also act and invest responsibly. Um, so, Jamie, should online brokers have a responsibility to their customers when it comes to providing them with the knowledge to invest sensibly? I mean, you have to, you, there's a lot of assumptions in that question, right? You need to you need to define exactly what it is, uh, the information to invest responsibly is that all, that uh, that almost sounds like you want to copy what Warren Buffett does, right? If you if you just want to put your money in the stock market so you can keep up with inflation, you just buy an ETF that's for this diversified like the S&P index or whatever. And you just let it sit there. You don't need any information. What's beauty about the, the uh, platforms like eToro and uh, and others around the world is you can just do it really simply from your cell phone, and it's it's very inviting to do it. It's really quickly. There's it's much different than it used to be uh, in previous generations, and it's instant. But when it comes to to investing, look, everybody, analysts and the biggest hedge funds and the biggest investment banks and uh, the most successful names that I can think of, they, they also sometimes get things wrong, including Warren Buffett, right? Uh, at the end of the day, it's a, ma a matter of saying, okay, well, what is it that I want to make? I want to make a lot. I want to make a little. Uh, people quickly learn that risk and return are one and the same thing. So if you want to make a lot, you might lose a lot, et cetera. Uh, and and at, at the end of the day, it does kind of become a, a, a bit of a guessing game. And the prices on the market 
at this point are proving to really be an economic function of supply and demand, right? Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see, for example, with GameStop. GameStop, uh, as we all know, the, the price shot up because of the popularity and people on social media uh, to valuations that were unsustainable, right? Like they pushed the price up from, I forget, $30 a share to over $200 a share uh, at the beginning of this year. And then you, you have analysts sit there saying, yes, 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 but these kids are going to lose all their money because it's not really worth that much. Look at their EBITDA, look at their discounted cash flows, look at all these fancy metrics. But guess what? It's been six months and that price is still up there. And guess what? GameStop has reinvented itself and now getting into things like NFTs and I don't know what it is. Now they have the money to really to pull themselves ahead. So while while the valuation at the time, the analyst might have been correct about GameStop, it's no longer relevant because GameStop now has a different profile on a business standpoint. Now you could potentially justify, I haven't really done it myself, so I don't know, but it's, it's I can imagine how it's feasible that with this extra money, they can now do whatever they want with it, right? So uh, when we're talking about what information you need, it's a matter of saying, well, what is it? What what is the end game? Do we want to make money now? Do we want to make money later? Do we want to save this company because now that's a thing? Remember? And by the way, that's what stock market was meant to do, right? Like the reason why the stock market exists, so companies can raise money so that they can reinvest in growth and blah blah blah. So you know, it's really a matter of, of what 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 your definition is of information. Go on, Yoni. What were you gonna say? <laughs> yeah. I mean, first of all, I think they're, what we're learning about our customers is a lot of them do need additional information and education, re really about two very sort of basic things uh, uh, that once people understand them, they, they will become more responsible on their investing, and that's uh, risk management and diversification. So, and, and, and as Jamie said, it's a risk reward you know, they're, they're one of the same. So if you're trying to invest in something which is high risk, high reward, if it can go up more than two, three times, it could probably also go to zero. There's a linear correlation there between those. But if you diversify uh, your investments across both lower risk assets, you know, whether it's value stocks, high risk assets, if those re assets are uncorrelated, again, this is finance 101 that people can learn at university, but a lot of people don't necessarily understand the importance of sort of risk management diversification. You are able to construct a portfolio which does have high risk assets, but it's still a responsible portfolio, which I think is, is again, what hedge funds do. It's what institutional investors are doing. And, and it's fine for us to think that now we want to bring that information and those capabilities and tools for retail investors to do. And, and I also agree with Jamie. This is Capital markets were constructed to create capital formation. This can happen with only institutional investors, uh, or this can happen instead of 20, 30, or 100 institutional investors with you know, a couple of million or tens of millions of retail investors, which actually provide you know, a, a potentially a better market. Are there risks in uh, things that's happening around meme stocks? Undoubtedly, there are risks around there. Have we seen very interesting stories like GME and AMC where retail investors actually push these companies to do a turnaround, whether it's going to be successful or not, that's not for me to analyze right now, but where these companies uh, were able to raise funds because of the support of retail investors and then potentially do a turnaround, yes, and, and I think that is the purpose of capital markets. And going back to that kind of understanding of, of the risks associated, how do we ensure that all investors have access to that kind of reliable educational resource? Perhaps coming back to you, Yoni. I think, again, we at eToro constantly try to convey that message of risk management, diversification, uh, the risk score in your account, so you can actually see your risk score. Uh, again, this, you know, meme stocks are, are somewhat similar to cryptocurrencies where we've seen significant rise in interest and demand as well on eToro. Uh, so generally, I think the fact that people get more knowledgeable, they get from us communication about it, but also on eToro, they can actually see what the most successful investors are doing. So and, and is, what we think is the best educational way is actually look at what the most successful investors are doing, then you can actually just replicate them 
manually, or you can decide that you want to automatically copy one of the most successful investors. So at eToro, we have our chief investment office, which provides both ideas, education, content, uh, as well as just sort of highlighting how successful investors are, are doing through very different times. Just as, as an example, we constantly see these corrections. Good traders and investors understand how to manage their portfolio when there's a significant correction. So there is not, they're not in a direct beta to a highly volatile, highly risky asset. So again, it's, it's really about giving them the tools, but I think over the internet, right, not only on eToro, but over the internet, People have all the tools they need to learn how to invest successfully in the markets. Yeah, no, I, if I could cut in, I, I agree 100% that nowadays the information is out there. It's just a matter of organizing it. And I do believe there's a component that we've seen uh, recently, which is the, the concept of kind of social information sharing, right? This is, a, a, I guess you can call it the social media kind of effect, but, but the, as, as social media has grown and, and matured, there's kind of been a formula that's been figured out where you do have this crowdsourced information that is manicured, that is, uh, uh, that creates this collective intelligence, right? Like I've recently started getting into the, the cryptocurrency world and more than cryptocurrency, the crypto, the blockchain technology. And, and I'm seeing applications, which I'm very excited about in which you can actually put these technologies to number one, fix some of the mechanics behind the regular, at least the U S stock, uh, market system, everything that takes place there, and to put this on a decentralized kind of a, a platform where people get together, they talk like they do on Wall Street Bets or the, on, on other platforms, they can decide which stocks they want to invest them, and bundle these things up into these ETFs or ETPs, these, these bundles of diversified uh, assets, which show up as just one little symbol, and they can just vote on it themselves, and all the people, all the individuals that go there and research and post their thesis, People can then vote on this and then purchase these securities that that are on the blockchain and try to spend all these different things. Uh, but but the, uh, but but it, it promotes this kind of information sharing, right? Which draws from all sorts of different experiences and sources and shared and discussed on social media. I think we should definitely expect innovation to accelerate. So so with, with the rise of retail investors all around the world and also the rise of new technologies you know, whether it's online platforms or whether it's blockchain, I think we should expect innovation within the retail investing space to keep on surprising people, to keep on progressing and sort of to open up this world of global markets really to significantly more people than it was open 10 years ago, five years ago, or even two years ago. And how do we democratize the investment ecosystem further, talking about kind of opening it up to even more? Well, I, I, you know, I, th I think that things are already, I think that that uh, spark has already been lit. And I, I think that it's going to take place in ways that I don't think we can quite imagine yet, right? What makes things democratized is access, right? How easy it is to, to get involved. Uh, and well, not, not only ease, is also like Yoni was saying earlier, how much money you need in order to get involved. These fractional shares that make it possible for you to buy stocks that per share are very expensive, uh, something that previously couldn't do. A lot of innovation is taking place there. I do believe, uh, I do believe the marriage of cryptocurrency with Wall Street is going to be the next big thing uh, that that just further globalizes the entire stock market. Right? Imagine having access. I live in Mexico right now. Yoni is in Israel, and a lot of people that I know are in the U.S. I can't buy stocks from even the U.S. It's a little tricky, but if I want to buy Samsung from Korea, I can't. Technologies like what we're starting to see with tokenized stocks on, on uh, the blockchain can now allow me to say, now I want to buy a little bit of Samsung and a little bit of Tesla and a little bit of, you know, some Telmex, a Mexican company, and, uh, and, and a little bit of Bitcoin all wrapped up into one place. And somebody can be sitting in India or in Australia or in Singapore and be able to do the same thing. And I think this goes nicely into the kind of the future of the stock market piece of this conversation. and. You know, despite there's been a huge hype of um, hype over retail investment over the last kind of year or so, I'd like to know if you think this will stick and will continue, a bit like you've been saying now. So, you know, Yoni, is it a trend we're likely to see continue? And do you think heightened regulation will enhance or hinder retail investors in the future? 
So, so f first of all, obviously, I'm a bit biased uh, <laughs> uh, as we are building a platform to open the markets for everyone to trade and invest in a simple and transparent way. Uh, uh, and we have customers from 100 different countries investing in US stocks and European stocks. Uh, so I, I generally think we're, we're seeing an inflection point that will continue and grow. I think that when you look at the cohort uh, of Gen Y and even more you know, younger Gen Z, but Gen Y for sure, the size of that cohort, this, this is going to be the largest cohort in human history and the richest cohort in human history. I don't think they've really, I think what we're seeing is the beginning. I, I think we're going to see ten, tens of millions uh, of investment accounts opened globally uh, from people from all around the world who are all interested. And that's something you can easily look at Google Trends. When Tesla goes up in a day 15%, you go to Google Trends, you write Tesla, you can actually see that the interest, the daily interest in the term buy Tesla stock or buy Tesla has went up in a hundred different countries in that day. And, and I think that's the big difference. The world with both lowering the barriers to entry, right? So platforms like Etor, which enable you to just download a mobile app, fund an account uh, immediately, buy a fraction of a stock commission free, but it's also about the fact that our generation has become very global. It's, it's not about local stocks anymore. The majority of stock, stock ownership in the world is still hyper-local. Financial institutions are still hyper-local. Most of the financial institutions in every single country where we operate are very much local financial institutions. But as a generation, social media, for example, is very global, right? You see people from all around the world that are interesting, whether it's Tesla or Facebook or Google or GameStop. It's people from all around the world who are interested in that narrative. I think that's a part of what we're seeing. We're seeing sort of the emergence of that one generation who is investing in the markets together, but also smarter globally. Brilliant. And I think I just realized the time, the last half an hour has flown by and I know we've got a number of questions from the audience. So I do have just a final question for both of you. Um, just if you can share what you think the stock market and kind of the retail investor role will look like in 10 years time, if you could predict. Perhaps Jamie, we'll come to you first. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't think if you asked me two years ago what it was going to look like in 10 years, I wouldn't have guessed what it's going to look like today. So, uh, you know, pretty much my answer is going to be wrong. But, you know, let's just go along the same trends. You know, more people, more, more individuals around the world are able to have access to uh, capital markets everywhere, or more than just capital markets, their finance in general, like, like Yoni was alluding to earlier. Now people can be in control of their own money if they want to make money or lose money or learn about it because they, once again, like you said, once you buy a certain stock, now you're interested in following the news about it. Now you want to understand why these things happen. You might even be interested in listening to these quarterly earnings, call, you get more involved with it. And so this can potentially spill over into other types of asset classes that are outside of capital markets. It could be things like real estate or things like, um, uh, well, things that you could currently buy with uh, futures and things of that nature, commodities and metals and energies and things of that nature, but just anything money related, I think people are now going to take control over it themselves and less and less centralize it to uh, an institution. Brilliant. Yeah. Go on, I, I think if, if, if you think about sort of the, the market structure, I think you were seeing two things. One is, uh, the democratization uh, of trading and investing, which will lead to uh, probably north of 200 investment accounts over the next 10 years. Uh, uh, and, and that is in parallel to the fact that people that have today several thousands of dollars, as they grow up, they, they amass wealth. So we are just at the point where Generation Y are starting to amass wealth, which means the, those millions of accounts are going to move from thousands of dollars to tens of thousands of dollars. Uh, and if you multiply those two numbers, you sort of realize, OK, that there are now, you know, trillions of dollars who basically shifted between generations. So this is a very big process happening with retail investors. And, and that's in parallel uh, to the democratization also of financial assets. So uh, as Jamie said, it should be very easy for somebody from Australia or Mexico or, or Germany to invest in any overseas, whether it's a security or whether in my view, and that's a big part for blockchain technology, if you want to build, 
if you want to buy fractional art, I want to buy a, a 1% of a Picasso. Uh, if you want to buy 10% uh, of an apartment in, in, in Poland or Romania, I think those investment opportunities are also going to be democratized through technology. So it's both sort of opening up the markets for more people to invest, but also bringing more opportunities, right? Democratizing those opportunities, which again, expands that capital formation and those two trends sort of sit on the first trend that i said we're going to see inflation uh we're going to see more people who understand that they need to invest in uh in assets because we're seeing uh sort of the the inflation and in actually real assets in real estate in the stock markets in crypto assets i in my my view is we're going to see that continue over the next 10 years brilliant Lots of opportunity in the next 10 years then. Right, I've got a few questions from the audience. So the first, what do you think of the NFT bubble? Will it burst or do you think it will become more and more acknowledged as a valid investment? Who wants to take that one? Uh, I'll take a stab at it, right? So, <laughs> you know, th this bubble would be slightly different, uh, unlike other bubbles in that it's the purest form of supply and demand. People, these, these NFTs, the prices of NFTs, uh, are, are really just a reflection of how many people want them. And if people don't want them as much, then the prices are going to go down, right? But I think a lot of the things that you can do with NFTs are number one for personal utility, meaning I personally get joy about having ownership over whatever this particular NFT might be. And I'm not doing it necessarily for money. I just want the, 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 the rights to do that they do that already with video games they'll dress up their little characters and they'll pay money to have different color suits right not not to have better guns or better access to whatever it's just to, to have their appearance and people value that so that value uh can't, it's difficult to translate that into a bubble people need to stop caring about those things uh but on the other hand if it does turn out into into a bubble like the you know famous the tulip mania from i forget which year or century uh, the, you know, bubbles are natural, they happen, and they're self-correcting, and they're self, uh, they, what do you call it? They go back towards the equilibrium, and so at the end of the day, that's just a process that, that shows the legitimacy and the health of any given market. Yeah. I, I would generally say, again, bubble bubbles and bursts are a part of how every market works. So people need to understand that, which is why you need to, begin diversify between different asset classes, etc. I think NFT have sort of a unique characteristics that a lot of NFTs and their different NFTs um, are, are more like a product uh, uh, rather than an investment. So uh, w when you're going and buying uh, Louis Vuitton, do you expect the price of that Louis Vuitton to s significantly rise? Uh, not necessarily. When you buy sneakers, do you expect them to rise? So again, NFTs are just products over the internet that can either represent digital uh, products or not digital products, right? So when you buy uh, anything offline, you don't necessarily expect it to have a price appreciation. And as such, a lot of the NFTs will probably go down in value, like a lot of products go down in value. There's better liquidity right it's hard maybe to sell it's better by the way you can actually sell your sneakers and, and louis vuitton probably online as well and sometimes those uh, sort of products appreciate in value sometimes they appreciate significantly in value but in a lot of cases where you have low liquid single market uh, assets if you don't have buyers right you don't create buyers demand that means that over time you might find out that there's no, no demand for what you've bought. So the price is what you paid for it. And actually the price to sell it could diminish to zero. So just, you know, generally buy NFTs. If you want to hold those NFTs, there's, a, you know, like every product, there are great products out there. If you want to speculate on products, you know, there are great companies doing that as well, uh, but that's a, a high risk game. Uh, so I'm going to come to the next question. So this probably came up because I know, Jamie, you mentioned cryptocurrency and the opportunity with blockchain um, technology generally. But the question is, what role does cryptocurrency play in the capital markets? I think it's 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 a first, it's going to be a tool, right? It's going to be a medium, just like eToro is. Uh, cryptocurrencies have fixed a lot of things from uh, conventional Wall Street. It still takes me three days to transfer money 
in the U.S., you know, through ACH or to clear a check. Like, there's no reason for these things to not be relatively instant. So I think and, and transparent and, and auditable and all these different things. So I think blockchain lays down the foundation, right? It's a component, a framework with which people can do uh, a lot of business with, and a lot of financial um, uh, operations with. I, like I said, mentioned earlier, I'm really getting excited about the idea of actually creating these decentralized funds, right? Like if you go to wallstreetbets.net, you can see this, uh, this new product that I'm helping create in which you have the mixing of all asset classes combined with social, combined with everything, so that you can pretty much combine, you know, like anything is possible. It's just kind of this uh, uh, object-oriented, if you're a programmer, uh, concept where you can say, okay, now I want to be able to put some of these assets and those assets, and I want to put some NFTs and like, you know, say some artwork or some real estate, whatever it is, and, and, and combine everything together in a decentralized, globalized fashion uh that's transparent and much more secure and it will prevent things that happen like we saw with gamestop uh with the us brokers like robin hood and uh, many others and and several other issues that deal with things like leverage or uh other you know we saw with the archegos capital um we've seen it with ltcm a lot of these things are fixed on the blockchain so i see more and more money going into blockchain uh as far as uh number of people or participants and also the average size of, of the participants worldwide I, I think there's like two or even three separate discussions, uh, which sometimes people sort of mix between them. I think blockchain technology, uh, you know, transformational technology, a paradigm shift in finance. I think over the next 10, maybe to 20 years, we're going to see most of the financial assets in the world. So hundreds of trillions of dollars are going to move to a digital native form, which sort of is 24 seven built upon public or private ledgers. So that technology, so moving financial assets and making them digital native and having those financial assets being able to sort of go cross border in real time, that's an inevitable future. That's like looking at the invention of electricity and saying, nah, that's not gonna happen. Like, so, so it doesn't matter whether we call it blockchain or digital native finance, that is gonna transform the financial and services industry, which today is still based on like uh, basically blockchains where one day is every block, right? Everything is T plus one, T plus two, T plus three. So I think that future is inevitable and that's the key interest in the technology. Uh, I think the other two parts is, is crypto assets uh, and Bitcoin. B Bitcoin represents a hedge against governments. It represents for a lot of people something which is a, a global uh, a currency or the currency medium, the medium of exchange of the internet. Now we need to remember that over 5 billion people in the world live in countries with relatively high inflation, bad banking system or no banking infrastructure. So people, when they live in places like Europe, the UK uh, or the US, sometimes forget there's 5 billion people out there that are living in places where you would not buy the local currency. And in general, even the best currencies out there, whether it's the dollar or the euro or the pound, are by definition inflationary. So you've got a deflationary store of value that a lot of people are passionate about. Uh, and I think that will continue to sort of uh, uh, r rise in adoption as, as a hedge against government, as, as a store of value for people who need that store of value as a medium of exchange for the internet. And then you have the whole range of other crypto assets, uh, uh, which some are, are more speculative or more high risk uh, than others. But I think every crypto asset has its own story, which you sort of need to analyze. Obviously, something like Ethereum is about decentralized finance and the Ethereum blockchain. But you know, you get all this crypto assets, which some of them are, are very interesting. Some of them are uh, uh, very high risk. But I think that form of investment, especially again when you think about this sort of global world where a lot of people don't have a good local infrastructure for finance banking, I think that does represent some opportunity uh, for people around the world. Again, people need to remember the risks. It is a, a, a high risk asset class by definition. Fantastic. Well, Yoni, Jamie, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. I'm sure that answered a number of those questions and I'm even more sure that people will be connecting to you after this. So thank you both so much for your time. I've really enjoyed this conversation um, and 
you know, thanks for thanks for joining us today at COGEX. Yes, thank, thank you, you very much. much.